Moore Lecture. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Martin. Bay Whitman. Just graduated from last year's and last year's day. So, to start with the LOR, um, I'm going to give a list of the roles that the LOR has to play. This list is pretty arbitrary uh, and incomplete, but I think it's a good way to mentally think about the kind of your duties as such when you're giving the LOR. So I'm just going to jump right in. The first and most important thing to know about the LOR for the, the list, though, is it is not a useless speech. You will hear a lot of people who will say the LOR is the easiest speech to debate. I don't know, maybe that's true. Uh, no, the answer. Uh, there are a lot. There will pe be people who will also say it's the least impactful and least important and speech. I had a judge, in fact, who has said, "Don't give your LOR. If you do, I'm going to watch basketball." And I had to sit down. It is very important that you get that judge to pay attention to you, because your LOR is very important, and I'll explain why. So, the the reason why I think the LOR is so important is you have a free opportunity with four minutes to re-explain everything, to make everything clear without the pressure, and to do impact calculus without the pressure of having to make new arguments. You get to make the PMR deal with a whole new set of framing, and most PMRs are not listening to you while you're giving the LOR. So you can straight up answer the PMR, and the PMR will just walk right into what the trap that you functionally set and have no idea. It's a very, very powerful speech. So, the roles of the LR will help you get the most out of it. The first is impact calculus. And I think by far and away the most important thing that you do. The second is you act kind of as the preemptor to what the PMR is going to say. The third, you're a fixer. Your MO is going to mess up sometimes, even if that does. And you're going to have to recognize that and fix it. And fourth, you're also a clarifier. Some debates get very, very messy. Maybe your LOC messed up because you did really weird orders on case, and then the MG didn't fix it. They just went straight down, and then no one knows what's happening. Oh my gosh. Well, you get four minutes to like explain a new narrative debate. What's happening? Uh, you also get to, wow, oh, that politics shell didn't really make any sense. I guess it's time to finally make it make sense. You get four minutes to do that. Uh, so I'm going to go in order through these various rules. So first up is impact calculus. Um, just a brief overview. I don't know if we have an impact calculus or if we do. Oh. No, really? Wow. OK, well, I guess we don't have an impact calculus. So for those of you, this, I'm, this is advanced LOR, but I don't want to assume too much. So with impact calc, there are three main things that you're doing. First is probability. You are discussing how likely it is that the bad thing, if you're negative, the bad thing you say the affirmative will cause, will happen, how likely that bad thing is. Uh, second, your time frame, how fast that bad thing is going to happen. And third, you have magnitude. How large is that bad thing? Almost always, you'll be saying it's uh, But you'll most of the time be saying something really, really, really big. So magnitude doesn't always play a big role. Um, uh, so, the way as an LOR you want to do impact calculus is you want to look at every single argument and how it fits into winning a debate. And so that means you have to you have to know how debate works. I know that's kind of a silly thing to say, but there are certain win conditions for you, and you have to know how each argument fits into a link argument, a no solvency argument reduces the probability that they solve, the probability that there's a net benefit to the affirmative. And so you can, when you talk about a solvency argument, you can talk about it in terms of probability. They've conceded that uh, they don't solve the economy because uh, you know, everyone goes offshore or something because of whatnot, and that means there is zero probability of there being a net benefit to the affirmative. Uh, you have to know the way in which time frame gets utilized. So time frame, some people will say, I really wish there was a lecture on this because I can't spend the whole thing doing this. But you will have to know that time frame controls uniqueness. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But if you are winning that extinction happens as a result of the affirmative in two months, it does not matter that they help people in six years because those people are going to be dead. 
which means you control the uniqueness of their impact because it's, it's going to happen as a result of their affirmative faster than they do anything. So they functionally do nothing with their affirmative. You need to understand that time frame also can turn case. If your disad causes economic devastation, and economic devastation makes it impossible to do health care or something, uh, I don't know why, it doesn't matter. And their plan is do health care. That means, but in like six months, and they cause that devastation in two months, that means that your disad means that they don't solve case. So you have to understand all of these roles. And I'm not going to go all the way these things fit in. I'm not going to be able to explain all of them. So, but you got to understand. You got to know. Uh, and then you have to apply it. The way I personally like to apply things and do impact out is at the start of my speech. Some people disagree. But I, my overview is always, because I know that impact out in my mind is the most important thing, is always a one word, a one liner, like, yeah, they messed up so bad. And then the disad outweighs three reasons. I always do three because that's easy. And then I do A sub point is time frame, B sub point is probability, C sub point is something. Who knows? Specificity, maybe. That's another thing that, will, that fits into impact activists. So you have to fit in impact activists. The second thing that you want to do is you want to pre. Uh, and by that, I literally want you to say, the PMR will go for this. He cannot do so because of this reason. And again, in order to preempt, you have to understand how debate works and what kind of things people are going to go for. Um, example, a lot of people like the term phrase prior die. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, it's this concept that if the affirmative wins, that extinction will happen ever, uh, like a thousand years. Maybe, but often it's like a hundred. Global warming is a good example. They will say it is try or die for the affirmative. It doesn't matter what that we might cause, because we're all going to die in a hundred years. So we have to do the affirmative. We have to try, at least try. So disregard any sort of negative consequences. That argument comes up a lot. As a preemptor, you might want to say they will go for try or die. They can't do so for three reasons. Uh, the first is that time frame does matter. Living 100 years is good. Second is, we can always solve the problem in 100 years. Who knows what if global warming is still going to be around in 100 years. But if you definitively know that the affirmative will kill us all in six months, you, should, you shouldn't try that way. Find another way to try. The third, we're trying with the counter plan. The counter plan is a functional, or maybe the status quo is from that kind of thing. Um, so preempt. The way I like to do this, uh, was explicitly say that, but I try to find really the weakest point in my whole strategy, maybe on my dis disadvantage, say they will go for this and then preempt them. Which leads me to my next point, which is you are the fixer and the MO will make mistakes. Um, the worst and most common mistake of an LOR and a PMR is to shy away from the mistakes that have been made by their partner, by themselves, and the LOC, uh, and just not to talk about it. Like, hope that the PMR isn't good enough to realize that you dropped the entire advantage. Well, that they're good enough, generally. You should assume that your opponents are good enough to pick up on huge mistakes. So, for instance, if you have dropped an entire advantage, and it leads to extinction. What would, what can someone say what an out might be? How would you win if you've dropped that we're all going to die in 100 years? Someone have an idea of how you would try to win something. Impact framing, just like make framing arguments about how like probability is number one and magnitude doesn't matter. Well, you conceded the advantage, so it's 100 percent probable that we're all going to die. That sucks. So what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went. It was something How else, but that's extinction. Time frame. Time frame. Yeah. Yeah. So this is. I don't. I think this might. I don't know. Drop the entire advantage. But there's been moments where I thought they're probably going to have functionally entire advantage. So my <laughs> LOR becomes like 45 seconds of time frame super important, and I had used that. I also had it the opposite way. Time frame isn't important. I had a little joke about like, who cares if we live for six months? We're going to watch six more 
when we get to watch half a season of South Park. That doesn't matter. Time frames are relevant. You know? I had those little phrases for when I felt like I was in a hole and I needed to um, to fill that role. So as the fixer, you really got to just recognize you made a mistake. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of mistakes that are often made. You know, if there's just an argument on a really good solvency argument or link takeout to the disadvantage, own up to it. Maybe even concede they might even win this argument, but the magnitude of the disadvantage outweighs. They might be right that it's really unlikely that people are going to switch their vote. But if we're right that people switch their vote, that means we die in like a matter of hours. Oh my god. I don't know how that would happen. But uh, so you always got to be thinking as a fixer, it's not necessarily, OK, I'm going to make a bunch of new arguments because you're going to oh, I can't make any arguments. It's not necessarily, I'm going to piece together four arguments to answer this. Sometimes it's just, OK, they have this thing in play. i got to figure out how to work around it. Um, you're also, your other role is a clarifier. And what I mean by that is, it, as a clarifier, you're not just repeating arguments. That's a big mistake of people who give the LOR. It, it sounds like the end. Uh, and that's when judges get bored and you have pictures of judges falling asleep. Um, um, uh, there's no debate about it. Is there a debate about it? There should be. I'm not sure. Um, There's a Tumblr. So you're not repeating, but what you're trying to do is add useful, clear, useful clarity to a position. Um, if the solvency debate has gotten really muddled, maybe you spend 45 seconds there, uh, you fix things. You can also reorganize things, which I would do a lot. Um, if the case debate is just super messy, uh, the way that I would always do things as the LORs, I would do entire sections. So maybe people jumped around solvency, impact, solvency, solvency. I would just say, OK, solvency debate. And I would discuss and talk through everything that was happening on that in that specific area. Um, and so that's kind of the four roles. Then next thing I want to do is kind of present a formula. Um, and I think I liked debating very formulaic. Uh, I don't think that's bad. It's unfortunate when you get a judge in the back of the room and you have the same exact wording for certain things. But generally, they don't notice. And even if they do, maybe they like it because they liked the phrasing that you used before. So I would always start with that same overview. Number one on your formula is start with an overview. Um, I like to do a one sentence, really quick kind of summary of what has happened in the debate. Like, you can't win a debate when you concede an entire impact. The disset outweighs. The ace of point is you know, that, that quick. Uh, with overviews, you don't want to be super long-winded. You don't want to be like, yeah, so we've like got this impact, and they have some answers, but they're really not as good as my partner's answers. And their app is just, it's not that good. Um, it's like, OK, but you know, I think we're going to win. Uh, you don't want to be long-winded. Um, you also don't want to be too, you don't want to repeat. And so some people don't like doing impact out at the start because you end up doing impact out later. Uh, so if you decide you like doing impact out at the start, try not to repeat yourself later. So for instance, you say these sub one is probability. What I started to do, instead of going through the arguments that minimize the risk of their advantage, instead of going through the case debate right there, I would just say, B sub 1 is probability. We have a litany. I love that word. Uh, it just sounds so good. Uh, we have a litany of case arguments, and they have very little on the disset. You know, just a brief synopsis. And that's how I would often treat the probability thing, just so I wouldn't repeat. Um, so once your overview is done, you want to transition. I always, almost always, put my offense on top. And almost, and I will say this, almost every time I put my offense on bottom, it was the wrong decision. Like, almost every time. Because if you don't have your offense, even if you really kick the crap out of case, it's really easy to lose with one dropped argument, one unresolved thing under your disadvantage. Because judges are plenty happy to go, 
well, okay, you, you tried really hard on the case. They have a little bit of offense, but there's this conceit argument that takes out your whole data set. Okay, I'm just floating on that. So you, I always put my offense on top. And when I get to a piece of paper, I do many overviews on that piece of paper too. A little summary why you're winning the disadvantage. You know? um, and then I break it into sections. Do the unit debate. And I, would, I like to tag by uniqueness debate. I thought it was efficient. Uh, people know exactly where you are on the flow and what you're about to be discussing. Then I wouldn't go through every single MO argument. I pick out one. Say it's a relations debate. You're arguing whether allied relations are good. And you would say, you can't win a relations debate uh, when the United States literally just gave a $10 billion to Japan in military hardware or something. Avoid, you know, posturing like that. Uh, and highlight one specific argument. Or, you know, preempt one argument that they're going to do on the unique And that's a good rule. It's don't go through everything. Uh, unless that's the problem area. And then you, that gives you extra time. Then you go to link debate, then you go to impact. A lot of people like to do impact out at the bottom of disadvantage. Uh, that's also a good place. Um, yeah, it sounds pretty powerful. A lot of people like to do disat turns case at the top of disadvantages. Uh, like they get to a disat, they go, disat outweighs in truth case. And then they explain the impact at the top of the advantage disat. You can do that too. I don't like doing that at the top of the advantages. I feel like, I don't know, it just seems too disconnected to me. You have won everything. You're talking about things before you um, On case, same thing. I'm trying to think of anything that's particularly noteworthy there. No. No. Somewhere there. Uh, so when does this formula change? I think there are moments when debates are very obviously going in a singular direction where you're not really threatened by anything but one argument. And there have been moments where I've just spent four minutes on that one argument. Uh, and I can think of there's a round online that I can think of this, uh, where we had won the criticism outweigh that K solves the case, the alternative solves the case, so the case was, the debate was relevant. We had won that the impact, the impact was see there's no value to life, it turns the case, God, it's terrible. The only out I thought was the permutation, so I spent the whole time on the permutation. That's okay, but I wouldn't recommend doing that until you're really comfortable. Because sticking with formulas is nice because you know Okay, maybe I could have done it a little better if I did it another way, but I did pretty good. I, my formula did me a good service. Um, next, miscellaneous tips. Uh, yeah, so the one way that you don't say everything that your partner would have said is you want to add strokes about particular sections. So on the case debate, something I like to do, I did a lot, is you know, uh, you know, Logan read a ton of defense, and maybe he read new defense in the end or something. Logan's my partner. Logan read a ton of defense. You know, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel and say it all, but I want to highlight this one argument. I wouldn't say it like that, but you get the gist. Um, that's a good way. To you know, there we have. There's a ton of uniqueness arguments back and forth, uh, and then you maybe get out of that by saying, "But this one's conceded, and this one's the real winner." Rather than, "Oh, we have this, and I'll explain it. We have this, I'll explain a little of this, I'll explain it." So always be looking as the LOR to when you get into the nitty gritty, the line by line, to get out of it as fast as possible. Because when you're in the line by line, that's when you're not being productive. You have to do it somewhat because if you just did impact out for four minutes. The judge, by that time, is going to forget all the, the arguments the MO made. The speech is not going to sound very coherent. Uh, and you really can't do impact up for a minute. That's like way too long. Um, yeah. In terms of time, Miss Tip, uh, I would generally say your overview and impact calc should take 40, 30 to 45 seconds. Um, I wouldn't go much longer than that. Whenever I went a minute, I felt like it was too much. Uh, yeah. Um, and I try to get to case with, like, at least a minute left. A minute feels a little too, 
I like a minute 30. Kind of like explains the difference. But um, yeah, a minute, a minute left. Otherwise, it's going to seem like case is a big deal and things are floating in the air. So, yeah, the next thing I want to talk about is the LOR with regards to the criticism. And I think for me, the LOR slightly changes when I was doing the creative thinking. I was not particularly into the K lit. I was my partner. Uh, he knew everything. And then it would come time to give the LOR, and I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Uh, a lot of people don't do impact calculus when they're an LOR on the K, which I find bizarre. Because I think fundamentally a criticism is a just strategic argument that talks about impacts. Uh, and so I find placing the criticism into the language of your impact calc and your formula is a really good idea. And what you want to do with the K, I mind, as the LOR, is make it sound really tricky. That was my, that's my favorite thing. Because you got a lot of tricks with the criticism. We have arguments, maybe you have a framework argument that says, fiat is fake, and nothing they said is real. It doesn't matter. Maybe they dropped it. So maybe you say three reasons they can't win. The first is that they conceded fiat is fake. They don't get any of their impacts. You have arguments like, there's no value to life, so why it doesn't matter if anyone dies? Doesn't make any sense to me, but it's almost in every single shell, and oftentimes people concede it. Uh, you have arguments like the alternative solves the case because it creates a hippie utopia where there's no violence at all. Uh, it solves the root cause. You can leverage that kind of thing. So that's how I always started off with the K. I tried to find three reasons, and I didn't say the K outweighs necessarily the three reasons. And maybe the C sub point was the K outweighs on magnitude. And I um, once you get to the criticism, I would suggest focusing a lot on the permutation. A lot of PMRs go for permutation. Um, rarely do people impact during your criticism. Uh, rarely do people successfully know like your criticism. A lot of people end up going for the permutation. I would start with the alt. That was partially because my partner went straight down, so the alt was last, and sometimes uh, that had a little less coverage than other sections, so I felt like I should go there first. Um, but the alt is also a good place to start as the LOR because the alternative explains how the criticism functions within the round. That's your solvency arguments are ex explanations of like what, why you would, like how do you change the world and why is the criticism important. So if you're starting there, you get to do um, a lot of things. So. You also want to be referencing specific arguments. And this is just a general thing for the LOR, true for the K, true for not. But you don't want to be, we outweigh on probability. Uh, you know, once you get into the nitty gritty, you want to be, they can't win the permutation because of this argument. Remind the judge, the one that's the most important, the link argument that matches, matches up with the permutation. Remind them the one that's the most important. Um, yeah. Uh, don't if you don't know the language of your K, don't try to speak it. Uh, if your ML sounded really smart on a Gombin and you don't know anything about a Gombin, just be impact helping. Just say like, yeah, it's the worst thing I've ever heard in the case. You, know, you don't have to reintroduce the language. Um, yeah. Next section is what not to do. So we, I've seen it before, but first and foremost, do not repeat your partner. Do not give an LOR that is just them up. The classic example of this is topicality. People will give a four minute repeat of, oh, I should talk about the LOR. Because that's really um, yeah, is it going to mess up everyone's notes if I talk about that first? Okay, I'm going to talk about the LOR and T. Or not, no, not. Um, and this will get into don't repeat your partner. So with a T debate, little we'll background, I consider a T debate and the standards debate within T. So you have your interpretation, you have your standards, all the reasons why your interpretation is perverse or horrible. The standard debate is really a discussion of the 
the world of debate. It's like print, the world of debate that is ideal. Is it better if we're specific? Is it better if the app has creativity and flexibility? Almost always, the negatives are doing uh, the former, that we need to be specific, we need to be very precise with our language, the app should have a limited amount of options because that allows an in-depth discussion, et cetera. On a T debate, I would always start off with, I would start with the words like, ask yourself, what world do you want to live in? Is this a world you want to live in? Uh, do you want a world where, and then I list all of the names that we have, where you're not specific, where the app is an infinite number of options, where debate is devoid of clash. You don't need to be, I love being dramatic, you don't have to be that dramatic. Uh, but that's, I think, a good way to phrase T. Um, once I've done the overview, I go to reasonability, and I go to that discussion, because that frames the way that the rest of the team debate is evaluated. So you pick out one reason why reasonability is meaningless and is just a please don't vote on TV, has no bright line, you know, explain why that's bad. And then, given that we won competing interpretations, uh, standards debate. Go to the standards. Don't try to redo what you've done in your overview. Try to really focus on preemption on T, because if you redo what your MO has done, you're just repeating. So in the, on T debates, I would really, like, they are going to say uh, they meet, is if you're talking about the interpretation. But they are doing that by redefining our interpretation, or however they're trying to cleverly read. No, we get to set the term. We get to define what our interpretation of standards debate. They uh, are going to say app creativity is awesome. But how far does that go? And how creative do the apps need to be? Do they need to have 100 options? Is six OK? Also, there's a bunch of creativity that's not just uh, writing 10, 100 different types of affirmatives. You could just have different advantages. Or, you know, you could have different stories and different impact scenarios. So there's a lot of different types of creativity. So try to really focus on prevention and your LORN T. Also, don't be afraid to sit down. A lot of LORs on T are like three minutes, two minutes. Uh, this is also just a general thing, too. You can sit down in the LOR. Uh, in a normal debate, I can't imagine why you would not want to use four minutes. But think about one thing to think about is you're giving the PMR time to prep. I, I vaguely listened to the LOR. Uh, and I would have Logan tell me if there was, in, as a PMR, I would have him tell me if there was impact that happened. So I could kind of listen to how they were describing how their videos going. But that was it. So in T, if you don't have anything to say, just sit down and you don't give them those two minutes prep. Uh, so what not to do? That's that. Yeah. First is don't repeat your partner. The T is the perfect, perfect example. Second is don't repeat yourself. And that's kind of harder than it sounds. Or it sounds easy, but a lot of people end up repeating themselves in various points. The trouble spots to look out for, uh, repeating your impact calc if you've done an impact calc section. Um, repeating, yeah, that, that's the main one when I find that people repeat themselves. Uh, if you're doing little mini overviews on disadvantages, because I, I just thought that sounded good, um, try not to delve into the discussion too early. Um, the third is don't, decide if it took it takes too much. Plenty of to do. Um, I think those are the main two trouble spots I'd say with the LOR. Uh, people also run into trouble in the LOR uh, with, like, not knowing what to do, but I've explained what to do. So I don't, I don't know how to go on from that. I'll just put a period there. That, that point's over. Um, I kind of 
want to have a lot of questions for this because the last time I didn't have any questions. Uh, and then I want to give a good example of what an LOR looks like. So first, questions. What questions do people have? So your partner's, like, if we're in the night block, your partner's giving their speech, you're getting ready to do your LOR. Is it all right to, like, just stop listening to your partner? For the, and like kind of like shell out what you're gonna like is, it, is that like or is it like on the spot like you should be thinking of the things that you're gonna be saying as you're saying yeah that. so what you're saying like you're the LOR and yeah um, listening to the what partner. I would do I would make notes uh, when my the MO made an argument that I want to reference specifically I wrote little dashes like right next to the arguments that's yeah, so you have the argument here and I'd write a little dash circling it takes a long time. And that would let me know the, that I want to talk about that. Or if there's like a hole and you're missing something, then I would write a circle like there's a problem. But no, I would not write out what I was going to say. My overviews were never written out. Uh, yeah, almost no. Because you, you have to know what they're missing. Because as the LOR, your job is to say, hey, you missed this argument on the disadvantage. Yeah. So if you're writing out what, you know. OK. So yeah. still planning kind of what you're going to be going over, but make yeah. sure you catch things. And it's hard to phrase how the debate is before the debate is taken place. Yeah. It's hard to, to pre-plan, OK, we're going to win this dissent because of these four arguments that haven't been made yet. Other questions? Actually, not write anything down. Like, it's just, you're just. No, I have. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, in debate. In debate. Like, I feel like if I. That, that's amazing to me that you don't repeat yourself. If, cause I feel like if I don't have something written down in front of me to look at to keep me on track, I'm like, ah. And then Wait, I flow. Well, no, I know. But that's, <laughs> that's, 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 okay. That's not what you mean. You mean like right, pre writing a speech if you're yeah. Well, that's so the thing I said, that's why formulas help me so much. Uh, and that's why I use them. Because I knew what my overview was going to sound like every single time. I knew where my impact out was going to happen. And it's also very important to uh, kind of memorize the way that you do impact out. Uh, so I really, I memorized, functionally memorized how I would explain, answer, uh, try or die. And the arguments that I would look for. We had a squo solves argument, I would say every single time, the squo is trying. Because I, I thought that was a phrase that was pretty cute. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, you know, I had, uh, obviously I had arguments for certain things to memorize because of the LLC answers too, but you know, I knew the way I wanted to explain a certain positions we went for a lot. Uh, you know, when I was going through the value of life argument, every time it was dropped, I'd say, this might be a sh like, you know, tech techie reason to vote nay, but it is a reason to vote nay. You should assess the magnitude of their impact at zero. So they have conceded that there's no value of life in the status quo. You know, that every time. So, when you go to a new sheet, say you have three DAs, you just quick overview why you're writing this page. If one you sentence, or just DAs as overview as a whole, as a whole, whole round. Are you saying each time you go to another sheet? Over well, I think time? I think every sheet is distinct. Yeah. So the reason you're winning the round is because you're winning the disad, but you also have a bunch of case turns, maybe or case or impact arguments. So when you say we're winning this round, you know, when you get to the disad, you're not saying we're winning the disad, but your overview might be. We're winning the disad, concede case argument, makes an easy vote. Okay, it just outweighs. So, the, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I would, I always did a little tiny overview on disadvantages. And it was oftentimes just a rhetorical tool. Like, um, an example, one overview that I remember giving is like, um, I did a review of it a lot, but it's but yeah, it would be just like, wow, no, uh, you know, only thumpers, no link argument, uh, only thumpers, 
No, no non uniques. It means they can't generate offense with these link terms. Maybe they you know something like that. I don't know. You guys are in your like mini overviews on each sheet, did you avoid trying to talk about how they played with other positions? Like you just talked about why you're wearing that position, that's, or yeah, that's generally how. Okay, so when did you really go into how they all work together? In the uh, in the impact game. Out. Okay. That's that's really where you're you're kind of painting the picture going this way, but also as you're um, going through the disad, you know, you're. Or extending, yeah, yeah, mainly the impact value. Like you say, uh, a sub point is uh, probability. We have a ton of case defense, uh, and our disset is humongous. B or B sub point is magnitude, it's, it's extinction. Uh, and since we're winning time frame, if you just talked about time frame, then you explain if that works together. Okay, that was basically my question. What would your recommendation? be as far as putting the impact cap at the top of the sheet of paper rather than like the bottom? Yeah, so the reason why I I put it at the bottom is because it, um, or I would put it at the bottom. I did it at the start of the whole debate. But the reason why I would not put it at the top is because I it just seems weird to me um, to say, I, it's, there's not much of a distinction. You could do it. So they decide our ways. That's sort of, you know. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. There's not really any special things. Another thing I forgot to say uh, is that as the LR, you're also explaining how debate works sometimes. Uh, like literally, you're explaining how debate works. Uh, a good example of this is you know the argument judge kick the counter plan. Uh, he of additional plan is that it is a test of an opportunity cost of the plan. Is there a possible world that is foreclosed by doing a plan that is preferable to the plan? So can you solve all of those advantages, you know, but not cost these disadvantage? That's a preferable, right? That's an opportunity cost of the contract. Um, and one thesis of thesis of conditionality is if you prove the counterplan is bad because there's a bunch of disads, that doesn't prove the plan is good. It proves there's the counterplan that is not an opportunity cost. But if the disad outweighs, then the plan is still bad. Um, and along those lines, there's the argument judge pick the counterplan for us. If you assess, for instance, that the permutation shields the link to the disadvantage, that you can do both, that would, it would, you know, it's one, the plan is liberal, but the counter plan is super conservative, and passing them both at the same time would like make everyone happy, so no one votes for it. So if you win an argument like that, firm shows the link. Some judges will assess, okay, the just said goes away, and the thesis of judge the counter plan is no, don't do that. That hasn't proven that the disad is that the plan is bad. It just again proves there's not an opportunity cost. And I would every time if we made that argument, just kick the counter plan for us. Assess the debate without the counterpoint. I would explain the process of that. The thesis of conditionality is it's a test of an opportunity cost of the plan. You should judge kick the judge kick the counterplan for us because a permutation chills the link argument doesn't prove that the plan is good. And I would say that. And there's various times when you feel, I feel like it's necessary to explain how debate works. And the nice thing about the LOR is you have the time to do that. And like, you know, try or die. Or disad turns case is kind of like a wonky argument. It depends on your critic, but some people are not going to get or like or enjoy certain techy things. So you get the opportunity to kind of explain how to be able to You have that much. Um, all right. So, um, oh, also humor in the OR. If you're funny, you should use it. This is your time. I was not a funny reader at all. I think people laughed, but it was not <laughs> because I was fine to it. Uh, but LOR is like the perfect time to be humorous when you're doing impact count, make jokes. You're comparing uh, their argument and yours. You can make jokes. You have that luxury, and jokes are a good rhetorical tool. So it makes it sound like you're winning, even if you're not necessarily winning on the flow. So you can also use humor. Uh, yeah. What I want, I, I want to try to, I want, 
want to video because that would take the whole thing, but I kind of want to go through an LOR. Uh, and I'll try to think, I'm just going to use around. I'm not using any names, but there's one LOR that's still in my head uh, that I can explain. So I'll set the scene. And this is not war stories. This is explaining. <laughs> no, it's not war stories. This is explaining uh, how the LOR works. The advantage is Obama can should only be allowed to spy on people with drones if he's first given them a hug. No, offered. No, given them a hug. Given them a hug. And that is critical because if you give someone a hug and Obama gives a bunch of people hugs, that will create an ethic of love and ethic of care in the world and prevent the inevitable extinction of the human race. Uh, we said that that would anger the Republicans. And it, it would cause, I mean, what the hell are you going to say? Uh, we said T, too, but that's probably not topical. But anyways. Uh, and we said this would anger or frame because we thought they were not going to defend the plan. We said this would anger the Republicans, cause uh, a bill that was going to support Ukraine to fail. Supporting Ukraine is critical, otherwise Russia's going to go. Uh, and my out, my dis, my dissent overview at the start was like, I read two minutes of tea. My overview was a little witty thing about, oh, there's a reason I spent two minutes on, on framework in the Yellow Sea, because if you actually have to defend the implementation of your ludicrous plan, there's no way you can win. Witty little remark that, you know, kind of makes your, the rest of your speech sound great. Uh, then overview. The dissent always, the ace of point is specificity. That's one I liked to use a lot. Uh, then I discussed how their impacts were ridiculously not specific. At some time in the future, at some point, there will be extinction because we just don't love each other enough. You know, versus our specific articulated scenario that causes extinction. These the point is time frame. Uh, I would say, the phrase I would say is, they might be right that we will die in a thousand, a million, a million, or they don't say when the time frame is. We could die in a million, a million, or a trillion years. But voting affirmative means we die in the interim. It means that thousands of generations of individuals do not have to experience the joy of living. You know. uh, see, the point is probability, solvency. There's there's six conceded solvency arguments. No chance they solve case means there's no benefit. Go to this disadvantage. Uh, little mini overview on the disadvantage about how uh, like the main argument that they were going for the disadvantage, which I don't remember, was not true, or something like, spend 45 seconds on an argument that's factually false. It's gonna, that's not going to be good for you, or something like that. Uh, then go through the uniqueness debate. Uh, our arguments had assumed theirs in some way. Explain that. Go through the link debate, which was really quick. You know, there was, I don't think there was a link argument. You know, 100% risk of a link. There's no impact defense. And they were entirely relying on their ethical care spreading to Putin, and then that means Putin doesn't go to war. And then explaining why that is very unlikely. That Putin is not going to care about the United States. Uh, go to case. Uh, then I spent like 45 seconds, because this, this is one of those times where I felt like I had the time, and this was the only out was a try or die argument. Spent 45 seconds, like, you can't go for a try or die when one, two, three, four, five, all of the explanations you, know, you don't solve. Uh, there's a risk of an ethic of care emerging in the future, all of those. Then, you know, extended a couple solvency arguments, that was the old. That's an example of an LR that I, the last, only one I can remember. Uh, does that give, is that helpful? That's an LR my book. When did you and your partner decide that you don't have those positions? Uh, I was at LOC PM my basically my whole career. Yeah, right at the start. Initially, it was because uh, I was terrified of the idea of answering disadvantages. I don't know why. When I was like a young kid, I was like, super straight scared. But then I realized ah, I have to answer advantages in the LOC. But we already said I don't have to speak positions. So. <laughs> yeah.